Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, we are here for to talk about uh, WebAssembly. If you have been here in the, in the previous uh, talks, we talk about PyScript, about PyDide. WebAssembly is the te technology which powers all the, uh, all these projects. Uh, I'm I started to become interested in WebAssembly when I started to work in Anaconda more than one year ago because I am the PyScript team and. Um, that, that, that's what I'm doing for, um, as my daily job. Uh, in the Python community, I'm also known for my work on HPy and PyPy. Uh, now I start to work on Spy, which is something that uh, I will briefly uh, talk about later, but I announced it also yesterday at the Lighting Talks. Um, so okay, WebAssembly. As I said one year ago, in April, a bit more than one year ago, I started to look into this because it was my job, and I became excited. I, 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 I think that it's an incredibly cool technology, and I will try to explain why. I think that the naming is a bit weird, because WebAssembly is not really about the web only, and it's not really an assembly. <laughs> so uh, what, what is it? Um, I did what every, everybody does nowadays. I asked it to chat GPT. <laughs> um, so WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Uh, the important part here is virtual machine. So, uh, the, the, the current way of thinking of WebAssembly is as a virtual machine or a CPU, like it's an instruction set. It's a virtual CPU which runs in many places, including in the browser. Uh, a distinctive feature of uh, uh, WebAssembly is that it's designed in such a way to be completely sandboxed and safe to execute, so you can execute untrusted code in, inside, for example, a browser, and be sure that uh, it can do anything malicious. Um, and, and it's a virtual CPU. It can run everywhere there is a, a support for it. Uh, browser is the main example, but you can run it outside the browsers, and this, that, that's why the web thing is not completely true. Uh, for example, you can run it inside Node.js, which is the same uh, virtual machine that powers JavaScript in the browser in Node. Uh, in Chrome, sorry. Uh, but there, there are also independent runtimes for WebAssembly. Uh, one is WASM time, which is just like you can run from, from the command line, WASM time, blah, blah, dot WASM. It is WASMer. There are many, many other. Also because WebAssembly is pretty small as, a, as an instruction set, so it's kind of easy to write a virtual machine for it. But since it runs in the browser, we can think of it as the most ubiquitous virtual machine ever, because if you compile something to WebAssembly, it runs everywhere, in, in desktop, in mobile, in uh, Wear uh, devices. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why it's becoming so popular. Uh, it's a standard. It's developed by an organization we call Bytecode Alliance, uh, where uh, companies and I think also individuals can join and, 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 and help the development. Um, so you need to think of WASM as a CPU, and it means that unless you're doing something very, very specialized, you're never going to write WebAssembly by yourself, by, uh, by hand. Uh, it's mostly used as a compilation target, so you can start from, from high-level languages, uh, C, C++, or et cetera, and compile them using a compiler to WebAssembly and then run it. Uh, it's designed in such a way to be very, 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 very fast because it is a low-level virtual machine, but we can call it LLVM, because LLVM is something different. It's a compiler, and yes, naming is hard. Um, it's a low-level virtual machine, and it's designed in such a way that uh, runtimes for it can translate very easily to uh, the, the bare metal CPU which, which runs it. Um, you can compile once to your program once to WebAssembly, run everywhere there is a virtual machine, which we saw it's a lot of places. Uh, from some point of view, it's the same concept of Java, JVM or .NET, compile once, run everywhere. But the big difference is that it's low level, so WebAssembly can, is, uh, you can represent pointers and structs and, and all these things which exist in the C and C++ world. So it's, it comes, it, it's very easy to port legacy uh, code to WebAssembly and run it in the browser. That's, for example, how you run Photoshop in the browser nowadays and, and uh, AutoCAD. Mm. But this is just like a very, very high level introduction and now I'm, I'm going to be a bit more low level to try to show what it means in, in, in more concretely. Uh, this is like 
kind of the hello world in WebAssembly, a very simple function written in C, which computes the factorial, it's so just a for loop, and, uh, uh, and we can compile it, for example, using slang, the C compiler coming with LLVM, to uh, WebAssembly. This is the command line which I used, it's not important. The important part is that it generates a WASM file, which is binary, and we can execute it later. Um, but I'm not going to you should show the binary because it's impossible to read. I'm going to show you the equivalent in, uh, in what is called a WebAssembly text format, which is a, well, human readable way of representing WASP, which is uh, abbreviated as what. <laughs> and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk was to show this picture. <laughs> so this is how the factorial looks like in what. Uh, I'm not going to explain everything because it doesn't make any sense, but it's a kind of list-like uh, representation. Um, so you, you see that inside the what you have a function, which is called factorial, and uh, you, you take uh, one parameter, which is an integer, 32 bits, it returns an integer, and you have local variables, and, uh, and it uses the loop, and you can see the instructions are very low level, so A plus B becomes this, and the compiler knows that this is, this is the type of A and B, and this is the instruction to get a local variable. So if you are a, a, a WebAssembly the virtual machine, it's very easy to compile this to native code. That's why WebAssembly gets very, very um, high speed. How do we run it? As I said, we can run it everywhere. We have a, 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 a runtime for it. This presentation is inside the browser, so we can run it from JavaScript. This is how you uh, run uh, instantiate a WebAssembly module from JavaScript. You have this API, which I don't know much about because I'm not really a JavaScript developer. Uh, but you can instantiate a module, and then you can uh, get the exports. So you can this is the factorial function implemented in WebAssembly. And then I can run it. And I, I, for example, I can, this is a live demo, and we will see if it works. What's happening here? I, it jumped somewhere in my, okay. So the demo, maybe it works, the, the, the slideshow doesn't. Uh, so I can compute, uh, yes, it works. So this is how you, you run it from JavaScript. Uh, nothing spectacular. But you can see that basically you can get a function which looks like a JavaScript function and you can call it from it and, and that's it. But that's, not, that's the, not the only thing that you can do. You can also run it from Python. So in this, in, in this example, we are outside the browser. We are on Linux command line. We write a, a Python program which we run with CPython, but we are using WASP time as a Python module to load and execute the WebAssembly. And it, the, 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 the concrete API is a bit different, but it's not too much different than what we did from JavaScript. So we instantiate uh, a WebAssembly module using this um, module um, API from WASM time, and then we can get a pointer to the, to the function inside, and we can uh, call it. So this already shows you how WebAssembly is useful to run stuff in, in multiple and very different environments. So this, is, this was the hello world of WebAssembly. You can, you can uh, uh, write a factorial, you can write things like this. So what you can do in general with WebAssembly? You can write computational intensive programs very easily, and that's it. But then really, like by default, that's, that's the only thing that WebAssembly lets you to know, to do. I said, yes, uh, I said earlier that uh, it's sandboxed and safe, uh, which means that by default, you cannot do anything, you cannot interact with the external system. You don't have any access to the file, to the file system. You cannot do any network um, connection. You can do any I.O., you cannot even print to the terminal. You don't have any access to system call, you don't even have libc, so you cannot do malloc and free. Uh, that's how you, you, you become very safe. But you, you say, it's like, this is not very useful, so you say, what are you talking about? Uh, the way we escape from the sandboxing is the, this concept, concept of WebAssembly imports. So uh, whenever I write a WebAssembly module, I can declare that I expect some imports from the outside. 
which are function. I can say that I expect a function which takes an integer and do something and returns a float, or something like this. But, and the imports must be provided by the host. And the, ho the host in the example uh, before is the JavaScript program which calls my WebAssembly or my Python program which calls my WebAssembly. This is the host. And the host can decide how to provide the functionality that the WebAssembly expects. And, and, and it, since it has full control over it, it can, it can make sure that you're not reading the wrong files, for example. Um, let's try to become, again, more concrete. This is the second example. It's, again, something very simple, but it's a function written in C. And here you can see that I have two external functions, which one from printing a, a, a string and one from printing a single integer. And I am using it from, uh, from this very simple C function. And uh, CLang um, compiles these external function references to WebAssembly imports. So I can compile this to WebAssembly. I get the, the what file, well, also the was binary, of course. And you can see that inside the what, I have these imports. So when I instantiate it from JavaScript or from Python, I need to provide these two functions from the outside. This is how you do it from JavaScript. So I implement print int in JavaScript, and I implement it by simply calling console.log, of course. We will see later print str. And then I define this object in which I put my import. And then when I instantiate my module, I pass the import objects. And then the WebAssembly runtime does the magic to put all the wires together. And, uh, and, and so my counter function will call when from C I call, from here in C I call print str, then WebAssembly will call uh, this function implemented in JavaScript. So as I said, print int is very easy to implement. Print string is much harder. Why? Because WebAssembly speaks only numbers. And uh, from the WebAssembly point of view, the memory is a big, giant JavaScript array. So uh, if I have a string in C, it's a pointer to the memory, a pointer of bytes, uh, to a string of bytes, and it's basically an index inside the JavaScript array. And uh, when I, 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 call a, uh, I pass a pointer from C to, to, to JavaScript, well, what JavaScript receives is a, is a number. It's the, point, it's, it's the offset in the, in the memory inside this array. So if I want to extract a string from memory, I need to read it one by one, for example. Uh, this is how I can get a reference to the WebAssembly memory from JavaScript. It's an array. There's some JavaScript thing which I don't really understand, copied and pasted from Stack Overflow, probably. <laughs> this is code that you should not show to children. Uh, I hope that Roberto, who has his kid, is not here, because I don't want him to, to see this. Um, it's very, very wrong code, but it, I, you, you, you get the idea. You read uh, byte by byte until you find the zero, which is the end of the string from the C point of view, and I'm building the JavaScript string, which is equivalent to what it's in my WebAssembly memory. And that's how I find, can finally print it. And I can do the same from Python. I can, I can write my, I can load my WebAssembly module using one time, and then I need to, um, to pass two imports again, print num and print str, and print num is very easy to do, and print str is basically the same. This is how you access WebAssembly module from Python using one time. And you see it's basically the same, uh, the same kind of stuff. You iterate until you find a zero, and you read character by character and building a string. This is also uh, not very good Python code. I don't have the excuse that I don't know how to run Python. I mean, I know how to write better Python code, but I think this is easier to read. Uh, this is how WebAssembly and their outside world communicate. Uh, but it, to, in order to be useful, you need to provide a lot of functionality. And I think that uh, um, a good example is how do you implement a file system. And this is where you can really understand to understand uh, the power of WebAssembly and the, 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 the way you can use it as a kind of lightweight container and virtualization system. Uh, imagine that you want to access the file system. Um, you, um, under the hood, you need uh, access to syscalls. 
You need access to a syscall to open a file, to read and write from files. And you can use them as imports. So your WebAssembly module will expect this kind of imports, and it's up to the host to decide what you do with them. And one way, one, depending on the context, but you could, you could say that whenever you try to open slash atc slash passwd, then you open the real file. Or you can say that you are opening a fake file in a completely virtual file system so that the WebAssembly module sees something completely uh, virtual and safe. Uh, or you can say, I want to expose only a part of the file system and, and block everything else. Um, it depends on, on, on the host, and the, the, again, it's the host that has control on it. Uh, we are starting from the, from the ground. I showed you something very simple with no imports, then I start to write a couple of imports my, myself, then I'm talking about the file system. It's not, I'm not telling that you should re-implement an operating system every time you want to use WebAssembly. Fortunately, there are ways to, well, there are projects which did it for us. Uh, the most well-known project in this area is mscripten. And uh, it's basically something which try to simulate a POSIX environment inside WebAssembly. So, from, from the point of view of you as a programmer, you use mscripten, and, and um, you can write your program using the normal syscalls, most of them, and mscripten will provide them in a simulated environment in JavaScript. Um, it's, mscripten is really written in such a way to, um, uh, to be as much compatible as possible with legacy code. So, uh, it, it's really trying to simulate the POSIX world. It has a lot of uh, existing libraries re-implemented in, uh, in, in, the, in the context of the browser. So for example, you can use libSDL for drawing on the screen, and mscript then will take care of translating this call into a canvas. So your SDL Pygame program can run in the browser using this technology. Uh, but since all the uh, runtime is implemented in, in large part in JavaScript, it means that it works only if you have a WebAssembly runtime, which supports also JavaScript which is the browser or Node.js. Um, if you want to compile something with mscript and run it with other runtimes, it's not going to work. Um, there is another way of accessing the external world, which is called WASI. And you can think of WASI, which is a, a WebAssembly system interface, I think. I, why I didn't write it in the slide? Um, WASI, you can think of it as a standard library of imports. It's a standard developed by the Bytecode Alliance in which say, oh, if you want to open a file, you need to have this import, and then the host knows how to deal with it. Uh, if you want to write uh, to the network, you can have this import, and then the host will see that you want to write the network and provide uh, a, good, uh, a good import for it. Um, and, and again, you, it's, it's up to you when you start the program to decide how to configure WASI to give access to the real file system or to a fake one, and et cetera. From some point of view, it's kind of the same problem space of mscripten, but a, a rule of thumb is that if you want to run your program in the browser, use mscripten. If you want to run your WASM program on the server, we're using these runtimes, use WASI. Uh, it, it, it's not completely true, but it's a good starting point. There are, there are people who run WASI in the browser because you can implement these imports also in JavaScript as I did before. So, um, but it's, it's, it's a good starting point to understand uh, the difference. WASI is divided into uh, multiple uh, sub-proposals. Um, so for example, you can decide, I want to expose only the IO part to my program so the program can use the file system but not the network, or only the, the clock but not the file system, and et cetera. So it, it's, it's still in progress, but uh, it's, it's what will happen in the future, that you will have fine-grained control over what you expose to your WebAssembly functionality. Uh, what we talked so far was the, how to access the uh, external world from WASP, but WebAssembly, the virtual machine itself, is also gaining a lot of functionalities. And this is also what is getting me excited a lot in, um, in, in, in this context space. Because 
The, the first iteration of WebAssembly was a very low-level virtual machine. Um, it was a virtual machine designed to run C programs with C semantics. So you have pointers, you have structs, you have memory, which is this giant JavaScript array, and not much. But now WebAssembly is slowly gaining one by one a feature which are useful for higher level programming languages. You have exception handling, which means that you can have two WebAssembly modules, one written in C++ and the other written in, um, well, not Python, but imagine Python, and I can raise an exception from C++ and catch it from Python and vice versa. Uh, this is not there yet, but it, it can be. And uh, uh, there is another proposal for garbage collector, so you can have a WebAssembly language, uh, language compared to WebAssembly which uses the garbage collector provided by the host. And the browser are very, very good garbage collectors, better than what we have in Python world. So, uh, basically, WebAssembly is becoming a platform for multi-language interoperability, uh, and uh, I think that this is something that we will see more and more in the future. Another ex exciting thing is the component model. You will be able to write a component in one language, expose some interface with high-level methods, and consume it from another language. So I can imagine a, a future in which I write components in WebAssembly in Rust and consume it with Python and then vice versa and, and et cetera. So uh, I think we are going towards this model of multi-language interoperability. We will see if I'm right. Uh, we are at EuroPython and I didn't speak much about Python yet. What about WebAssembly and Python? Um, if you want to run py, uh, Python in the browser, you can use uh, PyDide, that Roman just talked about. You can use PyDide inside the browser in PyScript, which is like a layer on top of it. And uh, in this case, you are basically executing CPython compared to WebAssembly. So it's an interpreter of Python running inside the browser, exactly as on my x86 computer, I have an interpreter running on, the, on my CPU. Um, so you have PyDide, which is basically CPython, plus a lot of pre-built scientific libraries, and not only scientific libraries, uh, comp already compiled by the PyDide team, plus an incredibly cool piece of technology which allows you to interoperate with JavaScript. Then we have MicroPython, which is also getting uh, support for WebAssembly and JavaScript integration. Then, of course, we have PyScript, that it's, it's what pays my salary, actually. And um, there is Jupyter Lite, which is as same as Jupyter, but with the notebook, uh, the, the kernel of the notebooks running in the browser and not on the server, again using PyDide. And there is PyScript.com, which is uh, this uh, service offered by Anaconda to, uh, to make it very, very easy to write and deploy uh, and share Python apps. And what I talked yesterday, Lightning Talks, in case anybody was here, I started work few weeks ago on Spy, which will be a compiler from Python to WebAssembly. So not only an, inter not, not an interpreter in which you have to download a big runtime, but you will be able to compile your Python program directly to WebAssembly. But it's, well, very, very low, uh, early stage and a lot of work in progress. So I think I'm done with my presentation. This is the link to the, uh, to the GitHub where you can find the, um, the examples and uh, a link to the slides. and. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Antonio, for the talk. Uh, now, you mentioned some things, some directions in the future. Uh, there's something I'd like to ask. What doesn't exist today uh, in terms of the ecosystem or applications that could be built uh, using these technologies doesn't exist, but you think you should. Uh, something that you wish this community build or... Uh... Oh, okay, that's a very, very broad question and hard question. So, what exists in the WebAssembly, what doesn't exist in the WebAssembly which I would like? I think that it's basically what I described. I, I, I look forward for when WebAssembly will get enough features to become the standard for multi-language interoperability. And, uh, uh, it's not Python specific, but I, I would like Python to, to be able to play a significant role in this. And I, I, I don't know who asked the question. I hope I, I answered. In case, please shout. Thank you. We have another question here. It's not working, yes. Is that one working? Hello? That one is working. Yeah, you can ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Hi, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to ask, uh, can you give me like some list of successful projects using WebAssembly on web or elsewhere? Uh, repeat the question, sorry. Uh, like some examples of a project that is successful using WebAssembly. Oh, uh, uh, as far as I know, for example, uh, Photoshop runs in the browser using WebAssembly and AutoCAD, as I said. Uh, PyScript, <laughs> I would say, I would call it successful. Um, I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what I, I've overread uh, rumors, but I think that WebAssembly started at Mozilla as a way to have a fast, a, a fast way to get uh, mm, uh, decoders for videos in the browser, and I think that's what Netflix is using for, uh, for DRM in, uh, in the browser, but I, I should double check this, this sentence. Thanks. Hi. Um, thanks for that, uh, that talk. It was uh, really interesting. Um, I have a question with regards to um, mscriptum versus uh, WASI. If I understand you correctly, uh, WASI is more like an interface specification, while mscriptum is, uh, is an implementation. Does mscriptum also implement uh, WASI? Uh, uh, not completely. Uh, also for historical reason. Uh, mscriptum started when WASI didn't exist. Um, so it, it, it created some API, which then was different, was created a bit different in WASI. As far as I know, whenever they can, they try to converge. Right. But uh, WASI is specified in such a way that uh, um, it's not completely compatible with POSIX. So sometimes I think they just cannot be WASI compatible. Right. Uh, but yes, from Simon, you, you, you are right. Mscripten is both a specification and the, the implementation. And WASI is just the specification, and the actual implementation is provided by the runtimes. Yeah, so someone still needs to implement WASI yes. for me. Okay, thanks. Another question up front, please. Um, if you had a C Python extension, um, uh, could you compile it to WASM and have C Python uh, import it as uh, like as if it was a uh, a native extension, and what would the stack look like? You, you mean the, the C Python compared to WebAssembly, or a C Python running in my desktop? On, on your desktop, yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, in theory, it could be possible. Uh, I fear that in practice, you will have a lot of small, a lot of the small and big problems, specifically because the C API is not really a good piece of. Uh, abstract. Uh, it's not really a good uh, uh, layer of abs abstraction over the details of the interpreter. So to start with, your assembly is 32 bits, and uh, uh, your uh, Python is 64. So all your pointers have different um, uh, sides, and uh, the C Python C API expects a structure which is filled uh, at this offset. Uh, so if you manage to solve all the details in WebAssembly, maybe yes, but. Um, what is interesting is to try to do what you suggested with HPy, which is another project which I, I work on, and which try to have a, a better or more abstracted uh, API, C API for Python. And this is something which eventually I would like to try, but it's not, it's not around the corner. Do we have one final question in the back? It's more like a request if you kindly could share your slides on Discord once uh, you're done. Thank you. I will. Uh, I think that is actually. I think that this um, this link is is a bit broken in the sense that are the slide of, of that I presented to PyCon Italy a few months ago. So it's the, they are exactly the same, but they contain PyCon Italy at the beginning. So if it's good enough, I can share this link. <laughs> okay. Thanks. This was the Q and A. Thank you so much, Antonio.